There we go. Cool. Um, so there's just a couple of things that we're going to talk about today with open source software. Um, first of all, we want to talk about what is open source software. I want to go through some of the terminology you're going to see um, and just generally like what the things are. I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Git, but there's a lot of other um, Git related things that we're going to talk about. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about how to find some open source software that you can contribute to yourself and uh, why you might want to. So first of all, what is open source software? Uh, open source software uh, or OSS, um, and the, there's also a, a separate term, free and open source software, FOSS, um, is basically just software where the, um, the source code is available and in which case you are able to modify it if you want to. So that doesn't necessarily mean, open source software on its own does not necessarily mean that there is no cost to use the software. Uh, and in fact, there is some software that you would traditionally pay for, but which they've made the code available. And if you wanted to, you could compile it yourself, you could edit it yourself. Um, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, there's also, again, there's free and open source software, FOSS, and that is you know, actually free and open source. Um, what does it mean for something to be open source? Does that literally just mean you can just look at the source code? Well, no, there's actually a whole, um, there's a whole definition. Um, let's see if I can pull up this website here. All right, here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and y'all should be able to see this. Perfect. Um, so this is a, a group called the Open Source Initiative or OSI. Uh, and they're the ones that really have set the standard for what open source means. Um, this is the, the definition that you'll most commonly see used uh, if you look up open source software. And in fact, they have taken some amount of legal action uh, in combination with some other groups, I think the EFF, uh, to make sure that the, um, the companies who claim to have something that's open source complies with this definition. So this is basically the definition that everyone uses for what open source is. Um, uh, so you have to be able to redistribute it. It can't be something that you're allowed to, you know, you're allowed to use the open source thing, um, but you're not able to, um, you know, to, to share it with other people. You have to actually be able to view the source code. They can't just give you, you know, some sort of binary file or some incomprehensible mess of assembly or something like that. It has to actually be the source code. They have to allow you to modify the software. So that's actually one of the things about open source software as well. Any software that you see that's advertised as open source software, you can modify it. You can make your own version of it. Now, they, they may be able, um, and most of them do, to not allow you to use the same name. So you might have to rename it. Um, and you can see that uh, here, there, there's this uh, thing about in integrity, right? So that this is kind of another thing is they're allowed to um, force you to change the name. They're allowed to force you to redistribute the original source code if you do want to change it. Um, but uh, you are allowed to change it. That's part of open source software. So any open source software you're allowed to change. Um, it's not allowed to uh, discriminate against different people. So you can't say that certain people can't use this. I usually when we think of discrimination, we're thinking of like, you know, discriminating on the base of sex or skin color or something like that. But in this case, what it means is um, you really can't discriminate against, you can't say like people from this country can't use this, or you can't say that people from uh, large companies can't use this. You know, it, if you're Microsoft, you can't use this, but Amazon can. Um, that's not allowed under the definition of open source software. Um, similarly, open source software can't restrict you from allowing certain types of people from using it. So you can't say you can't use this in um, cloud computing, but you're only allowed to use it in, on, you know, in hardware that you own that you're running at your house. That's not allowed. Um, you have to distribute the license um, with it. And it, it has to be, uh, basically it has to be a sort of license where you don't have to sign a contract with someone. It's, anyone who uh, visits the website gets access to the software under license. It's not something where you sign a license with Microsoft to get this and then it's open source software. Um, it can't prevent you from distributing it with other stuff. Um, and uh, this is 
fairly technical. Um, so I'm not gonna get into that specifically, but that's the general idea of open source software is basically it's software that, you know, in a nutshell is you can view the source code, you can modify the source, the source code and you can share it with other people under some conditions and you don't need to sign a specific license. So that's what it means to be open source software. Now there's a lot of different um, implementations of this. This is not a specific one size fits all thing. There's a lot of different implementations in terms of how people do open source software. And we can talk about some of the licenses. Uh, if people are interested, I'd be happy to, to talk about that. Um, you can just drop it in the Q&A if you want to learn a little bit more about what the different types of licenses are. You've probably heard of some things like uh, the GPL, uh, MIT licensed software. Um, at Code Day, we use the, uh, usually we use the Perl artistic license, um, but there's a lot of different different means of complying with this definition basically. But that's the gist of it is all of the software is gonna allow you to redistribute it. They're gonna allow you to edit it. Now, there are a couple of places that um, you can find the source code for most software nowadays. And one of them is obviously GitHub. So GitHub is, is probably the most common place where most people are, are keeping um, keeping the source code to open source software and where most people are collaborating. And that's mostly what we're going to focus on today is GitHub. Um, but there are there are other places. Um, GitLab is one of them. Uh, so GitLab is, uh, is a hosting platform. They don't really have an easy way to go and browse through all of them that I found. But um, GitLab is a common one that, that uh, some places use. Um, and then another one is SourceHut. Uh, so source hut is another place where where some people keep their code and you can see it you know. one of the things that you'll see with a lot of open source software is it doesn't look great um, and you can kind of see this doesn't look great uh, and there's a few other places as well you know some some people really host everything entirely on their own but um, you'll generally find that github is is probably the most common Okay, so we've talked about what open source software is. It's software that you're able to um, view the source code, to modify the source code, and to redistribute it under some sort of, you know, license, some sort of conditions there. Um, what are some of the terms that you need to know around open source software? The biggest one that you're probably going to need to know is the term fork and the term pull request. So. There's a lot of open source software out here. We can actually look at um, Linux. You've probably heard of Linux. Uh, Linux is actually on uh, GitHub. It is open source. That's one of the reasons why people like it. It's open source. And it's on GitHub. Um, you can see it has 1 million commits. Uh, Get the version control program was actually written by the creator of Linux specifically for Linux. So it's all on here. And you can see that the last commit was an hour ago. So lots and lots of activity. Obviously, not everyone is going to be able to just directly edit Linux on here. In fact, if I sign into my GitHub account, um, I don't want to do this. If I sign into my GitHub account, you can see that I can't edit a file on here. And in fact, if I were to clone this to my computer and try to push to uh, this repository, Tavald slash Linux, it would not let me do that. It would not let me edit it directly in here. Now, that's not a restriction of GitHub as a whole. Uh, if I were to go into, for example, github.com slash code day, which is some of our software, which is licensed under open source. And let's say I was to go into the Labs GQL project, which is the open source uh, project that powers um, uh, that powers uh, Code Day Labs backend. Uh, if I were to you know go to go into one of these files here, I can edit it directly. And again, if I if I try to do that in the Linux source code, and I try to edit it, you'll see it's saying you're making changes in a project you don't have access to. But if I try to do that over here in a project that I you know, directly control, uh, no problem whatsoever. 
So I'm, I'm not able to just edit anyone's code is the point that I'm trying to make, right? That's one of the, one of the um, key factors in basically making open source software work. Because you can imagine if this was like Wikipedia where anyone could edit it, the software is probably not going to work properly most of the time. It's, people are always going to edit it and mess something up. So what you have is uh, these people that are called maintainers. And maintainers are people who have right access to the open source software. And they're the ones who will actually decide what code makes it in and what code doesn't make it in. There's typically a really small number of maintainers, and usually they're not paid. So one of the disadvantages of open source software is oftentimes you end up having to wait a little while to get your changes reviewed because the people there aren't paid to do this. And so they're not really, you know, it's not their full time job. They're going to do it at night and the weekends and whatever else. But so these maintainers are the ones that typically will have direct right access to the source code and everyone else won't be able to do that. So how do I contribute? If I want to contribute to Linux, how do I contribute to Linux? How do I make changes to this? So remember what I said there, there's two words that we need to know fork and pull request. So if I want to make changes to Linux, what I would do is up here, you can see there's this button right here. This is fork. And I can choose, uh, well, I already have one under my own username, so I, I can switch over to that. But um, basically, you can choose your username or you can choose one of the organizations like the Code Day Labs organization. And I can make a copy of this repository over there. So again, I've already done that. So I've already done that. Um, let me just make sure. Yeah, this is all up to date. Cool. So this is my copy of Linux. I can make changes here. Now, this is not the main copy of Linux. This is my copy. But remember, one of the things that we said about open source software is that people are allowed to change it. You are allowed to change it. That's totally OK. You can make copies of it. You can edit it. Now, if I were to make significant changes, I would need to rename it. I, I believe under the Linux license, I believe I couldn't call it Linux. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I had an overnight flight last night, so I'm still a bit tired. Um, so if I were to uh, to go ahead and make edits this, I, if I were to make significant edits, I would need to rename it. But I can, I can make this copy here, which is on GitHub is called a fork. I can make a copy, I can make edits, and then I'll be able to request that they that they change things. And if I'm wondering who the maintainers are, Linux and many projects actually conveniently provide a file right here called maintainers, um, which explains how to make changes and also lists who is in charge of different components, which is pretty convenient. All right. So let's say I wanted to make a change to Linux. Now, I don't know what sort of change I might want to make. Um, you know, let's say that, uh, well, Linux is probably a pretty complicated example. I, I, maybe I shouldn't have chosen such a complicated example. Uh, let me see if I have uh, a more simple and straightforward example of some changes that I've made in the past. This will work. I think this will work. Well, this is, uh, here's a good example that someone else has made. Um, this is good. Give me one second here. Yeah, this is a pull request that I made. So basically, if if I make changes in my local version of a repository, so if I were to you know to just go into one of these files and edit something, it really doesn't matter what. But like, let's just say that for whatever reason, I want to wanted to to add that. Normally, you'd make some actual changes, but let's say I wanted to add that. Now, what if I want to get these changes back into Linux? What I would do is I would create what's called a pull request. And so what I can do is I can go back here to my copy of the repository. And you can see it says one commit ahead. And there's this button right here that says contribute, and it's got this little icon. So if I click this, I can click open pull request. And you can see it's saying, here's the things that I've changed. Uh, 
Uh, interesting. Okay, so Linux is actually um, preventing me from making a pull request because I guess they get too many of them. Um, and so there's probably some process for doing that. Uh, but in general, this is how it would work. And so normally on the screen, there'd be a, a big text field that I could put some text in. And then I'd, I'd have a button that says create pull request. And what that does is it, it opens up something like this. So here's an, here's an example of a pull request that someone else has created. So uh, Nikhil, uh, who is someone who uh, works for us but does not have right access to our code directly, um, has requested to make some changes. And what he's requested primarily is that he wanted to create some new files, uh, import photo input, um, photos where, uh, query utilities. Basically, you can see there's a bunch of stuff related to keeping track of photos of uh, events that we run. So all this stuff related to photos. He wants to uh, merge these, um, these changes into the main repository. So he's made a fork, he's made a copy of the repository. He's made some changes to his copy. Now he wants them to be back in the main copy of it. So he created this pull request. And again, that was how, how we did it was we, uh, you know, we made some changes to something and then we would click on that um, contribute button and then it would pull up a little interface like this. And then once, once you fill that out, usually you would add a description. And then uh, what you would get is something that looks like this. Nikhil did not add a description, but that's because he sent it to me in, uh, in a chat, but usually you'd want to add a description as well. And, um, and then I left some comments and I said, here are some things I want to change. You know, this is uh, not exactly the way I would want to do it. And so Nikhil actually made some more changes and uh, I have still not merged it. So that's, you know, that is my fault. But this is typically how things go. So this pull request thing is a way for the maintainers of the software to make sure that the changes that you're making are in line with the way that they want to see the software go. Their responsibility is for curating the way that the software is going to be edited. Now, if you don't agree with what they do, that's okay. What you can do is just keep your own fork of the software. And people do that sometimes. There's many forks of software that are actually uh, maintained completely differently than the official one. One thing that pops on, uh, off the top of my head is a thing called Manim. Uh, Manim is a um, piece of software for, for creating uh, math videos and computer science videos. And uh, it's mostly used by a YouTube channel that's very popular called Three Blue One Brown. Now, the um, the official version of Manum is the one that the uh, person who runs this YouTube channel uses. And there are a lot of things that he didn't want to include in his version of the software that other people wanted. And so there's a separate version of Manum, which was a fork of the original one from many, many years ago, called Manum Community. Uh, and this is a totally different version. They have totally diverged. There's the official one, and then there's the community supported one, completely separate uh, features in, in many cases, because it's, a, it's just a different version of software. The people who maintain the official one did not want to merge some things that a large number of people wanted to see, and so it diverged, and now there's a, a fork. So that's the general idea behind forks. You know, if the maintainers don't agree with what you're changing in a pull request, your options are basically you can continue to have your own version of it as well. So that, that's also an option. That's the cool thing about open source. But most people do contribute back to the main thing with one of these pull requests. And you say, I want to make these changes, and the, the people approve it, and then your change is merged. How does someone become a contributor or a maintainer? How does someone become those people who are able to edit those things directly? In many cases, that's the people who created the project initially, but also people who are really active in creating pull requests will oftentimes be granted maintainer status. It's not like something where it's like some corporation or something has to hire you. In many cases, it is members of the community who are very active are granted maintainer status or are granted the ability to write things directly, even if they're not necessarily maintainer. Yeah, that's true even for pieces of software that's made by companies. So for example, React and React Native are primarily made by Facebook, um, but they are community supported and there are people who are maintainers on the software that don't work for Facebook. All right, so that's the, the general idea of how we make changes to open source software is, is through those, uh, those pull requests um, and by making forks of the, the software. Um, I did wanna just double check, let me see. 
yeah, so it seems like there was a little bit of interest in what software licenses are out there. Um, so let me see. There was a really neat tool that I found for um, coming up with these. Uh, was it this? No, it's not this one. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Chooseleicense.com. Perfect. Um, so uh, this is this is the thing that I really like. Um, as a website, if you're trying to do, if you're going to make software and you want to make it open source, uh, this is a website that I really like that compares some of the different um, options out there. Basically, there's a lot of different software licenses. And when I say licenses, I literally mean like legal text. Um, there's a lot of different software licenses out there and they, they all have more or less the same things, um, but some of them are going to be slightly more different than others. So probably the most popular one that I see nowadays is the MIT license. And you can see here's what the MIT license says. It's very short. You could read the entire thing. It, it's still in legalese, but you could read the entire thing. It's not very long. You can see here's the summary. So commercial use is allowed. You can distribute it. You can modify it. You can use it for private use. Um, so basically, if you're not using it commercially, you don't necessarily have to share your changes. As a condition, you have to share the license and copyright notice. And it says that basically that you, the author, are not giving them any warranty and you're not liable for anything that happens. So if someone uses this in a self-driving car and the car hits someone, it's not on you. It's on the person who used your software. This is probably the most common one that I've seen. The other really common one is the GPL. Um, the GNU GPL is, is the main one. And this one is a little bit longer, you can see. So this is not anywhere near as short as the MIT license. Like I'm still scrolling here. Right? Pretty long. Now, it generally says pretty much the same things as the MIT license. So you're allowed to use it for commercial use. You're allowed to distribute it. You're allowed to modify it. You're allowed to use it for private use. It's got this other one here called patent use, um, which basically says um, patents are different from copyright. So normally this would be like a copyright thing, but if you have like, if your software does any sort of novel idea, like some sort of new thing, you know, it's like if you were to invent cars, even if someone builds a car differently than yours, you could still have the patent on cars for a certain amount of time. Uh, the GPL does explicitly say that you can't do that. Basically, if you license something under the GPL, anyone who makes changes to it is granting everyone access to that patent. But here is the thing that the GPL does uh, that is a little bit different. So um, the conditions of it are that everything that you, um, everything that is related to the GPL software must be released, and especially GPL v3, because um, they've made a few changes to it over time. GPL v3, basically, if you use any GPL v3 license code in your software, you have to release the source code to all of your software that talks with it. Now, there's a little bit of a, a nitpick there, um, which I'm not going to get into of exactly how you define this, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, one of the reasons why the GPL is very controversial is because if you are, for example, a company, you probably can't use any GPL licensed software anywhere because it would require you to release the source code to all of your software. So if you work for Google, you can't use any GPL licensed software. If you work for Apple, you can't use any GPL licensed software. So why would you, as someone who maybe wants to make open source software, want to use GPL? Or why would you, you know, want to contribute to a project that uses GPL? Well, the reason people came up with GPL is because it was uh, fundamentally, they believed that all software should be available to everyone. Anyone should be able to edit the source code to any software. And so because they believed very strongly that everyone should have the right to modify the software they run. They made this GPL and the intent was very specifically to make a lot of software open source that wouldn't otherwise be open source. So those are two of the really big ones. There's the MIT one is basically just saying, I want people to be able to modify this software that I'm making. And there's the GPL, which is saying, I want anyone to be able to modify any software. And if you want to use my software, you have to agree with me. 
and you have to make your software free as well. But there are a lot of other ones as well. And if you go to this website, choosealicense.com, you can take a look through, um, you know, through some of the uh, some of the, the different ones. Here's another one: a GNU uh, AGPL, which says network use is the same as uh, distribution. So basically, if you host this on a website, uh, if you even even if you're not making any changes to your software, if you're hosting your software on a website somewhere. It, like if you use a database that's AGPU, AGPL licensed, you may have to give the source code to your software. Um, there's LGPL, um, so there's a, some other changes to the GPL license. And then there's a lot of other ones that are more or less gonna be the similar or the same as the Apache, or sorry, as the MIT license. So like there's the Apache license, which is pretty much the same, but it says you can use the, the patent use and you have to state what you've changed. Um, there's the, um, the Mozilla license, which requires that you use the same license, the same exact license, and then there's a bunch of other ones out there. Um, uh, the, again, the one that I usually use is the Perl Artistic license. Um, and you can take a look at what it is here. Uh, there should be a summary. Here we go. So it has a lot of the same things as some of the other ones. Um, the main one is that it says that uh, you don't have the right to use the trademark. So basically, if you make a fork of it, um, you have to come up with a new name. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, I usually use the artistic license, because I want to force people to come up with a new name if they want to make a fork that's well maintained. Versus something like Manim, where there's two versions of it, I find that confusing. Um, I don't like that, so that's why I usually use the artistic license. OK, so that is licensing in a nutshell. Now, if you're contributing to an existing piece of open source software, you don't really have the right to choose what license you're making those contributions under. They are under the license that the software uses if you want to make that contribution. So you have to decide, do you like the license that it is uh, that it's under? And if you don't like that license, you can't contribute there. Okay, so how do we find open source software that we want to contribute to? Well, again, one of the easiest things to do is just to go to GitHub and to take a look at what's out there. Um, so GitHub now has some recommendations. Uh, this is one of the new things that they have. So you can take a look at some things that they think that you may want to contribute to based on uh, your uh, programming languages and other things like that. So maybe, for example, it thinks I might want to uh, contribute to h.io, which is a marketplace for video games. This is open source. It's in TypeScript, which is the language that I'm familiar with. Uh, so maybe I want to contribute to this. So if you're just looking for things to contribute to, um, ways that you want to, uh, to help out, um, this can be a good way to do it. Another thing you can do is if you go over to this Explore page, and then I usually like to go to Collections. Um, and these are uh, sort of community moderated lists of things um, that are open source software. So maybe I want to, you know, I really care about open data. For example, here's a list of open data projects. Or uh, you know, I want to support open source projects that were made in Africa. So here are some examples of some things that were made in Africa. This is a, a good way to find software that you can contribute to um, if you're not sure what you want to do already. But typically, the way that most people decide that they want to contribute to open source software is there's some software that they already use where they want to make some change, or there's some bug or something like that. And you know, you just go out and you find this, the original repository and you make those changes. So an example of this, if I go back to my, uh, to my examples, to forks. Um, one of them, for example, was this project called ESP Home. And the change that I made to this software was that um, it didn't, uh, this is for like home automation, and it didn't support a particular sensor that I had. So I added that sensor to the thing. Um, I don't know where it is. Uh, I don't know why it's become a little, GitHub changed their interface fairly recently. Um, and it became a little bit harder to find a pull request that you've made. Don't see way to find this on Google either. Yeah, this is unfortunate. I don't know. 
I hear you, a T6615. I don't know what, uh, what software this is, but here's a change that I made basically. Uh, I added this new sensor to it. So this is a new sensor that, uh, that can detect basically the CO2 rate, uh, the, the amount of CO2 in, in, my, uh, in my house. So I made that request, I forked it, I made the changes, I, I pushed it back. Another example of something that I've changed in the past, um, I, oh, here's a few. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the Marble Machine videos, um, that there was a, a band called Winter Garden that did a video of a Marble Machine that was really popular way back in the day. And they have a very popular Discord server. Um, and a lot of people help uh, out with engineering problems. So I helped them uh, make some changes to their uh, bot that, that moderates the, um, the Discord server. Um, I made some changes to GraphQL tools, which is basically a thing that um, powers a lot of the APIs that we use. Uh, I made some changes to uh, Node Sonos, which is like a thing for some speakers that I use um, to allow them to be controlled. Uh, and I think I even made some changes just to some documentation where like I was trying to use this tool called the XDo tool and I needed a flag uh, to um, basically to find certain windows that were open on my computer and I couldn't find it. And it turns out it existed, it just wasn't documented. So I edited the documentation. That's an example of a, of a change that I made over here. Um, yeah, this is all it was. I just added this text right here. It wasn't even a code change. I literally just added this text so that it said that this flag existed. And then I made a pull request for that. So that's how I think most people contribute to open source software is not by finding a specific project, but by finding a project that you already use and then making a change, either a change that you already wanna make or going to that project's repository and looking for some open issues. When you are on a repository of a project, so let's say I were just to go to something like ESP Home, or maybe WeVote is another one that's pretty popular. Let me go to the originals. Uh, this one is not a good example. Uh, here we go, this is a better one. Uh, a lot of places will have something like uh, difficulty easy or another label that you'll see as good first issue. Uh, those are really good places if you're just getting started and contributing to that project. Those are issues that don't require a lot of knowledge of the code base in order to make contributions. Now, one of the things that you will find with open source software is oftentimes you need to get familiar with the code base before you can make those contributions. So just be aware that's totally normal, totally expected. Um, I can send you after this some resources on how to get familiar with, um, with a new code base if you haven't used it before. Um, but it's totally expected that you'll have to get familiar with the code base. It's not expected that it's gonna be easy to make these contributions sometimes because you literally don't know a file to change. So I can send you some resources on, on how to do that in, in just a bit. Uh, we have a, a whole video series on it. Uh, but for now, I, th I think that should be pretty much it. So I'm going to end it here. Um, that's kind of the gist of the things that you should know about open source software. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A, and I am happy to answer them. Uh, so someone asked, does Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation's work have any influence on what Code Day Labs work does? Uh, for example, the Free Software Foundation has been vocal about education, educational institutions using non-free software and abusing their rights, such as spying on students who are forced to use their educational institutions non-free software. Um, one of the reasons that Code Day Labs exists in the way it does, uh, there's, there's kind of two reasons uh, that we've chosen to do the open source software. Um, one of them is that uh, for most students who are participating in Code Day Labs, uh, we're not able to give them a stipend. Some, we have worked with some of the schools and some of the states to give stipends to students, um, but most of the students are not able to get stipends for working on this. And because of that, we don't want you to be doing any work on anything that's proprietary. That doesn't seem right. Um, but working on open source software is giving back to the community. It's not generating any value for like a business. It's not generating any value for us. So that's one of the reasons why, um, why we uh, have set up the things the way we have. The other thing is, yeah, I, you know, we do really think that open source software is an important part of the things that are out there. It, it's really important that people, I, I personally believe that it is important that people be able to modify the, the code that they run. And so 
um, you know, having uh, software, for example, in schools that is closed source uh, that you can't modify and yeah, that does spy on students and all sorts of other things like that. I think it's not as good as, you know, having free and open source software. Um, now, granted, a lot of schools have been starting to use more and more open source software. So for example, if you use Canvas in your school, that is open source, uh, or at least most of it is. Uh, how will contributing to free and open source software benefit me as a coder trying to eventually attain a career? Great question. Um, there are a couple of things, uh, one of which is that we have found that working just on school projects and assignments that your teachers give you is generally not going to give you enough experience to get a job on its own. That doesn't mean you can't get hired. Companies will hire you, but you will usually have to do a lot of learning on the job to actually become a competent programmer. If you start contributing to open source projects, you generally are gonna get a lot more relevant educational experience in how software engineering is actually done. Uh, the biggest piece of that, and I think we've mentioned this many times at Code Day, is that the, um, the way that things are done in real life is uh, people don't always know what they're doing and they have to figure it out. But the way that things are done in school is very step-by-step, -step. here's how to do this, here's how to do that. And those two are very different. So, one of the advantages to helping with open source software is you will get a lot more experience with how to read a new code base, how to get up to speed with the new code base, how to figure out what file or what method you need to change to make a change that you've been asked to make. Um, those are all really, really great pieces of education that you can get out of this. Uh, the other thing that uh, open source software can do for you as a career is it gives you the ability to say, I worked on this project and people know about that project. So if you are regularly making contributions, for example, to a project like um, React or React Native, there are tens of thousands of companies that use React. And there are lots of people who can say, yeah, I made a portfolio website using React or something like that. Or yeah, I did a school assignment using React. But how many students do you think can say, yes, I have contributed to React itself? There are a lot less. And so it really does give you a, a leg up in the job market a little bit. Um, a last thing that I'll say is contributing to open source software is a really good way to build your professional network. Um, so again, if you're working on something like React, you're, who are you going to be working with, right? If you make a change and you do a pull request, who's going to be reviewing that pull request? It's going to be people who work for Facebook or who work for Airbnb or other really big companies that use React. And those engineers are people who are going to know you and are oftentimes willing to even talk with you. Uh, we have had some issues with Code Day Labs, um, some uh, issues on GitHub repositories where a person who works for like Facebook has chimed in and said, if anyone has any questions on this issue, just email me, I'm happy to help you. And, you know, gives their, gives their email. So it's a good way to build up your professional network as well. Uh, how long should I spend uh, time to work on a project, such as three months or six months? And when I realize that I'm going down a rabbit hole and uh, ask for help. Uh, thank you. So uh, how long should you spend working on something? It really depends on the size of the task. I mean, like some of these are pretty small and some of these are pretty big. Um, if you want to contribute to an open source project, um, usually... Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't think there's any tasks in open source projects that are just publicly available that are going to be longer than a couple weeks of work at most, um, unless you really have very little time. Usually, you're probably not going to spend more than a couple weeks on a specific contribution. Now, you may spend months working on the project in general, but on any specific contribution, usually you won't spend more than a couple weeks. Um, when should you realize that you're going down a rabbit hole and ask for help? Uh, I would say if you're struggling with the same problem for more than, you know, probably four or five hours, uh, might be a good idea to, uh, to ask for some help from someone else. Um, as you get more familiar with the software engineering process, the process of basically figuring out how to read a code base and like where changes may need to be made and debugging and doing your own research, as you get more familiar with that, uh, you probably will get a feel for when you really do need to ask for help versus when you can still continue to look into things. Uh, but as a general rule, a couple of hours is probably a good amount of time to spend on trying to solve a specific problem. Now, I'm not saying a couple of hours total on that pull request or on that uh, trying to solve that issue that's open. Um, 
But if you're like, you know, you're trying to solve a specific problem, like you can't figure out what file something is in or something like that, and you spend more than maybe two or three hours, um, that's, uh, that's a good time to ask for some help on that. Um, likewise, you really don't, with, with any of this open source stuff, you really don't want to be just completely silent. You should generally be communicating. If you start working on something, for example, it's a good idea to just post in the issue that you're working on, just to let people know that you're working on it so that someone else doesn't do it first. Uh, there's no reason, it's not competitive. Like, it's not like people are actively going to try to do the issue first if you're working on it, um, unless they really need it done faster. They're generally, if you say you're working on something, you know, people will give you a couple of weeks before they start working on it themselves. All right, any other questions? Cool, all right. Well, that is open source software in a nutshell. Um, I will send you the video resources on just how to get started in a new code base because that's useful, I think. And um, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks so much to everyone for coming and have a good rest of your day.